to kick off right now. So uh, again, thank you very much for, for joining us. Today we have a very uh, exciting topic to discuss with you. So we will uh, be talking about plant phenotyping using UAV. And, uh, and for this, so um, to, today, we, before we start, we have a change in cast, as you've probably noticed. Uh, I'm not Alexis uh, from Hyphen. Um, Alexis is stuck in a plane in Dusseldorf in Germany. Uh, the plane didn't take off today, so uh, I'm, uh, you, you're stuck with me and, uh, and Fred today. So I'm George Gillet. I'm the R&D director at Hyphen. And uh, I'm joined by uh, Fred uh, Barre uh, from INRA. Thank you, Fred, for being with us today. My pleasure. Um, so be before we, we launch into the topic, we'll um, just have a, a quick word about CAPS, which is the organization, uh, that the, the research unit um, that we work with. Uh, uh, Fred, Fred, can you tell us uh, in, in, in a few words, um, tell, tell us more about CAPS? So CAPT is a group of about 20 people working in uh, Avignon at the uh, National Institute uh, of uh, um, National Institute of Agronomical Research, um, where uh, different uh, institutions uh, are working together. So mostly uh, technical institutes uh, like Arvalis uh, working on cereal or other working on other crops, uh, IFEN, uh, so the startup and uh, INRA people. So we try to, uh, to develop um, different methods, mostly remote sensing methods, either from the satellite, but also from uh, UAV, as you will see today, uh, but also for sensors uh, mounted on uh, robots or just on, uh, in the field for monitoring. So that, that's the main, uh, the main activity of CAPT. And of course, we have um, a, a lot of scientific papers being published. Um, we, we have a, an online archive that you can visit on the website that contains all the, the papers we, we publish at CAPT. Um, before we continue, just a quick word to say that the questions um, are being recorded in here by a moderator who's not on the screen. He's sitting right next, next to us, so he's, uh, he, he will be uh, logging the questions and uh, and we'll answer your questions at the end of the presentation so we'll talk for about uh, 20 minutes or so presenting the the, the, the topics and then we'll uh, we'll uh, cover your your questions uh, right after that so so do not hesitate to ask questions during the, the presentation um, so the, the presentation today uh, has three main uh, axes. One will be about uh, acquiring data using UAV. The second is about uh, processing that data. And uh, the third is about the traits that we, we can uh, derive uh, from the data set. So these are the, the three main themes uh, we will cover. And um, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a, a surprise for you. Uh, so, um, uh, we, are, we are excited to, to make a few announcements at the end, so, so stay with us in, until the end. And um, right into the, the first topic, what we uh, wanted to highlight today um, very briefly is the fact that acquiring data using UAV, <clears throat> as most of you probably already know, uh, is, it can be a challenge. Um, and, and most of the, the, the issues or the challenges that we uh, hear clients um, telling us about acquiring data is uh, around things like stitching images or calibrating the data sets or um, being stuck with blurred uh, images. These are uh, examples of challenges that we face every day when we uh, try to acquire uh, data. And for that, uh, you need a robust acquisition protocol that we developed here at Hyphen uh, that helps to avoid any of these issues. So the, these issues uh, tend to be caused by things like using the wrong equipment or the wrong sen sensors or the application and the data sets we are trying to get, uh, setting up the wrong flight parameters uh, before the, the, the flight mission and uh, the flight conditions on the day that could be inadequate as well. So these are examples of um, things that might disrupt the acquisition, but obviously they, it is not a, an exhaustive list. But, um, at Hyphen, we basically developed um, a way to go around these things. Uh, and what we've done is develop a piece of software that um, contains a lot of information about the sensors, about the traits, and about the, um, the flight parameters. 
And what we uh, offer to clients is a way to basically, once we select the traits that we are interested in, um, find a way to suggest uh, the best equipment to, to use. So we, we automatically, in a way, can suggest the type of UAV, the type of sensors that should be used. And uh, we, we provide a range, not just one device uh, as such. So uh, the equipment first, and then um, the, the, the flight parameters that the drone operator should input um, to, to prepare for the, the flight mission. So th this is uh, very valuable, and this is really to avoid any of the, the main issues. And the, the data that we provide in, in that part of the, the job is to it basically covers here all, all of the parameters that the drone operator should care about. Uh, so we have more than 20 flight parameters here. We're not going to cover all of them one by one, but uh, what we uh, end up with in the end is a, uh, a checklist, uh, depending again on the traits, uh, on the phenological stage that we are targeting and so on, the, then we, we provide this checklist that the flight um, and drone operator can use and refer to. And one of the big advantage of that is basically to prevent uh, the risk, as I said, about having faulty data sets, uh, but also to be able to uh, align data to provide consistency across all of the drone operators uh, that you, your organization might have um, globally. Uh, and one last interesting point that we see uh, happening more and more is that um, this is used to train uh, internal staff for companies who are uh, now in-housing uh, these uh, skills. So we would be very um, happy to uh, to work around that with you in a way to, to make sure that the data that you acquire uh, does not end up in the bin uh, and, and, uh, and you get the most value from it. So, so th this is really what we wanted to highlight about the protocol uh, today. Uh, th this is one way to, to solve the, these issues. Uh, we, we spent more than five years in the field uh, running a lot of experiments now. And, um, and with CART, we have um, uh, a large amount of experience um, on, on this topic. So, so all of that experience has gone into this piece of software I mentioned and the checklist that you, um, you've received. Um, so, so this is uh, one important point we wanted to highlight. Um, once all of the data has been acquired, uh, it goes into uh, data processing. So the, for that, what we wanted to present to you today is Cloverfield, which is the name of our online data platform. Uh, in this platform, uh, as we'll see in a second, we can do a lot of things. And um, uh, the data visualization is one aspect of it. So you can visualize your data. but. Um, there are different type of outputs that we wanted to highlight uh, today. The, the data that you basically drag and drop into the system um, will be automatically processed. Uh, and the, the type of outputs you, you can derive are in one way uh, what we call direct outputs. So the, these could be raw data, raw data like multispectral uh, RGB data. Uh, you could have intermediary outputs. So here, uh, we talk about co-registered images, uh, georeferenced images, and microplot extraction. This is very important because a lot of um, uh, the, the work we do is based on the microplot uh, data. So we do not work, for instance, on the automosaic uh, data set, but we work on the, um, the, the, the underlying microplot extractions, we, which um, provides a lot more um, accuracy to, to the results. So all of these intermediary outputs are uh, things you could also get from uh, from Cloverfield. Uh, and these uh, happen before the, the traits themselves. So the, 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 the data set uh, for all the traits and indicators we will compute will also be available, of course. Uh, and so on that basis, we'll uh, jump into the, 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 the traits uh, discussion. And from here, I'll pass on to uh, Fred, who is going to cover uh, the, the different traits we um, we can offer. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, just so um, so we, we can group the traits into different categories. So we identified six categories. Of course, there are different ways to classify classify them. But so mostly there are traits that correspond to the uh, description of the architecture of the crops, uh, traits that correspond to the uh, biochemistry of the of the leaves of the organs. Um, so uh, vegetation dishes, 
uh, which provides some proxy of different uh, agronomical uh, variables. Uh, we have a disease symptoms traits, um, traits derived from the dynamics of uh, the observations uh, to, uh, to track the phenology of, uh, of the crop, and also uh, traits that characterize the, uh, the quality, mostly the heterogeneity uh, at the plot level or at the platform level. Um, so I, I will browse uh, briefly around uh, these different traits. So for the archi architectural traits, um, we find a list, it's not an exhaustive list of, of traits, and I will uh, illustrate that. So mostly they are traits related to, let's say, the, the rough uh, canopy uh, uh, description, like the cover fraction, like the green area index or the different index, like the orientation of the leaves. They are traits related to the uh, uh, efficiency of the light interception, uh, either as a fraction of the intercepted uh, light or either as a total quantity, so uh, along the growth cycle of the light that is uh, intercepted or absorbed, that may be useful for biomass uh, estimation. And then we have more detailed uh, plant uh, structure um, traits like uh, counting plants or organs, uh, getting the height of the crop or characterizing the lodging of uh, the microplot level. So I will I will briefly um, go through some of the traits. So for example, for plant counting. So this is an example of a maze uh, where we, with a high resolution, so the resolution is around, uh, I don't know precisely, but I think it's uh, about a half a centimeter, something like that. So with uh, deep learning techniques, we try to, um, uh, identify, uh, localize uh, the plants, and then once they are localized, uh, we can count them uh, over uh, a macro plot. And this is uh, the, the typical example that we got that, that shows that uh, generally we have got, uh, when we have good quality measures, we have a quite nice uh, estimates of the plant counting with some degradation that I explained here, either because of the image quality or because uh, sometimes there are weeds that are not so easy uh, often to um, to detect uh, or to um, to distinguish from from the plants. Um, we can count organs. So again, it's uh, based on uh, deep learning techniques. Uh, in this case, it's uh, ear counting of uh, wheat crops, and we can see that on this graph that we, we can achieve uh, quite nice uh, uh, results. Um, so for to get such uh, nice results, you need to uh, to train uh, with a quite a large um, data data set uh, that uh, includes a lot of uh, different uh, conditions or domains. Um, so which is a combination of the uh, elimination conditions, uh, the stages of the measurements and possibly the different, uh, let's say, genotypes, because there are sometimes there are owns, sometimes there is no owns, and that makes, of course, a difference. So we have to cover all this variability in order to get a robust uh, estimation of uh, the, year, uh, the year's uh, counting. Um, another trait that can, might be interest is the, uh, the stem counting. Just after harvest, you have the little uh, section of the straws here, of the stems. And you can identify them uh, based on the same uh, deep learning techniques with uh, quite uh, quite good accuracy, as shown on this uh, example. And this um, stem identification might be uh, quite interesting because you are not only um, identifying the stems and uh, getting the stem density, but you can also characterize the stem diameter and then compute the bio volume by multiplying by the height of the crop. And from that, get an estimate of the biomass, uh, which was shown to be to be uh, probably changing from conditions to to next one, but uh, within one conditions, uh, relatively uh, let's say accurate uh, estimation. Um, of course, one of the simple traits is uh, the, the the green fraction of the coverage fraction uh, that can be done in different ways. Here, it's it's done uh, through segmentation. So you, we identify the uh, pixels corresponding to the crops. And then um, we can, with that, uh, 
look at uh, the dynamics. So this is an example here of dynamics. And here it's not exactly uh, from UAV, but it's from images, uh, the same type of images that can be acquired from, from the UAVs. And this can be uh, very interesting, especially uh, people uh, are generally inter interested in um, uh, the stay green. And uh, with this uh, type of monitoring, you can uh, uh, quantify the stay green um, between different uh, genotypes. Maybe it's worth highlighting here that for uh, this type of traits, we have different methods. So as Fred mentioned, here we work with uh, segmentation, but we, we also use deep learning. And um, to, so, so we, we use different methods to cross validate the results as well. Yes. So they either segmentation with different methods or either by using a more empirical uh, or not empirical based on uh, radiative transfer modeling, but uh, inversion. But so there are different ways um, that you can use uh, from, from, let's say, more or less the same kind of images. Um, so next one is uh, identification of organs. Just an example to, to, uh, to show that we can identify quite easily. Here it is not too difficult because it's quite red and the same shape, but uh, we identify the uh, uh, flowers of uh, poppy crops uh, with a good, uh, very good accuracy. Um, plant height is uh, very interesting. So from UAV, uh, we can uh, get a uh, 3D point cloud by using the structure from motion uh, techniques. Um, from that, we can derive the height of the of the background of the soil and the, the height of the of the crop and by, by the difference uh, or the distance, let's say, to the sensor, the altitude, by, by making a difference between uh, the crop uh, height or top of the crop and, and the soil, we, we got uh, plant height. And then we can compare the plant height from UAV to uh, some kind of reference plant height. Uh, here it's uh, measured with a LiDAR system. And you can see that we, we, we get, uh, generally speaking, a quite nice uh, fit uh, between the, the, the two uh, types of um, measurement of the plant height. And what is very interesting, again, is to, uh, to get dynamics of the plant height. Because from the dynamics, you can see, uh, um, you can have a proxy of the behavior of your crop, of the functioning of a crop. So here, an example with the same cultivar. One in an irrigated conditions with three replicates. The three replicates are very similar. Uh, it's uh, very homogeneous. And the other uh, three um, curves correspond to non irrigated uh, uh, treatments with uh, three replicates. And you can see that the three replicates are quite different. And this difference uh, can be explained actually by the uh, soil water holding capacity. Um, and we can see, I can see here, but I got the image. You can see that you can date when the stress uh, start to impact the growth of the curve, at least uh, for, for the height. So that's a very interesting uh, uh, way to characterize the functioning of your crop. Another trait is uh, trying to characterize the lodging on the, on the crop. So this is an example here of uh, maize. Uh, where by looking at the height from, again, from the 3D point cloud uh, derived from the structure from motion uh, techniques, uh, we can quantify for each microplot the uh, fraction of, uh, of the plot that is uh, uh, subjected to, uh, to lodging. Leaf chlorophyll is very um, interesting uh, because it's uh, closely related to the nitrogen uh, functioning of the of the plant nitrogen processor. So here we um, illustrate uh, what has been done for the estimation of the leaf chlorophyll. So the chlorophyll content at the leaf level. Of course, you can do that also at the canopy level, which it's easier at the canopy level, but at, at the leaf level, it's a bit more difficult. And for that, actually, uh, the approach that we uh, developed uh, is to get a high resolution image from which uh, in the different channels with a multispectral uh, uh, camera. And then uh, we uh, try to segment the image to make a distinction between the green pixels and uh, the background pixels, and then just uh, focus on the green pixels. So of course, for that, we need a high enough spatial resolution. So in this case, you can see that the spatial resolution is too degraded. Um, 
it will be difficult to get uh, pure or green pixels and then you will uh, increase uh, uh, let's say you will decrease the accuracy of the estimates of the graphic content so then when concentrating on this uh, green pixel uh, green pixels you can correlate uh, some vegetation indices computed on these uh, green pixels so this is going back to the vegetation indices as well um, with the chlorophyll content measured at, at the leaf level and you can see here that uh, this is on a case on the sugar beet uh, we get a quite nice uh, estimation with relatively good accuracy uh, less than three microgram per square centimeter it's, it's quite good uh, for chlorophyll content estimation Another trait is, uh, which is uh, more and more um, uh, expected by, by, by the breeders or by the farmers, is to uh, score the uh, symptoms uh, of different diseases. So this is an example of the Sarcospora on uh, sugar beet again. So what we did actually is um, to uh, build a training database where we uh, have the score from the expert at the plot level. And then we have uh, different criteria, so mostly as uh, a number of spots, uh, style, the size of the spots. You can see Cercospora is uh, characterized by small uh, spots here. And the grain fraction, or the, the fraction of senescent uh, uh, material in, in the image. Um, and using those uh, inputs, uh, we uh, try to estimate the score that is uh, visually uh, uh, derived, uh, visually scored by, by uh, experts in the field. And you can see here that it's working uh, quite well, especially uh, for the, uh, let's say, medium to high scores. For the low scores, that's true that the, the agreement is not so good. But uh, again, uh, the, the uh, let's say, the accuracy associated to the expert um, scoring is not also uh, too good. So, okay. That's a part of the explanation, of course, part. And what is very interesting is that uh, we, uh, we were able to, to show that there is some kind of irritability. So in one experiment where, so I, uh, AUDPC, it's the, actually the average value of the score uh, along the, the, the growth cycle. Um, if you compute that over uh, the non-treated uh, uh, infected uh, uh, modality here, so the one that is the most uh, uh, infected by, by the disease. If you compare this score for the different gen genotypes uh, to um, the, the same genotype, but uh, for other modalities, uh, either not treated at all or uh, let's say uh, non, non infested or fully uh, protected. Uh, then we can see that we have a ranking that is very consistent uh, with uh, between treatments, uh, which indicates that the scoring is quite uh, consistent, a uh, very robust uh, way to, uh, to score in an automatic way, a high throughput way, uh, disease in, in the field. Uh, that's um, going to the dynamics again, um, so we can uh, get the uh, the, the, some estimation of the green frag of, of, through the green fraction of some phenological events. Uh, for example, here we can uh, get uh, close to the flowering when it's close to the maximum. Uh, generally, we have uh, the end of the uh, uh, tillering uh, stage uh, where we, we start to, to get the stem elongation and so this uh, is it. And, and then the, uh, of course, maturity is quite easy to uh, to see, you know, I already shown this curve previously. Okay, um, and last, uh, last trait to characterize the heterogeneity of uh, the microplot um, in terms of the uh, stand uh, population. So this is an example uh, on sunflower, uh, where we have uh, in white the sunflower plants that have been. Uh, uh, identified by the, uh, uh, the the pipeline, and in red you have the missing plants, and it's very important to know not only the number of missing plants but also the structure, let's say the size of the gaps, because if you have a gap of one plant, maybe it's not too uh, much a problem, but if you have got a large gap, uh, 
the border plants will not compensate fully uh, this uh, large gap. So it's very important to get this uh, distribution of the size of the gaps. And this is what is shown here. You have here the cumulative probability of, uh, let's say, the size of the gap. So uh, when you have no gap, so no missing plant, okay. In this case, we have uh, almost 80% probability to get no uh, no missing plants but then we get about uh, what 15 percent to get one missing plant and then uh, two missing plants so a larger gap uh, with maybe three four percent and then of course larger gaps or very large gap are, are very improbable but they exist as well so these are some kind of statistics that we can derive from the images yeah just maybe before going into q a the the, the other thing that we compute using plant gap is basically what we call here the, the border effect, which is where using the, this um, as an input to understand if the micro plot is being affected by um, by as gaps in, by the neighboring, by the plots, neighboring yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so we have a trait called border effect and a trait called plant gap, um, and then we provide uh, two di distinct outputs for that. Um, so thank you, Fred. The, this is a great overview of some of the traits we uh, we are able to compute. We we didn't list everything, uh, otherwise we would have spent uh, two hours talking uh, to you about that today. Um, so what we suggest now is to go into uh, Q and A, uh, and for that we'll uh, turn to uh, our colleague uh, Jeremy, who's been uh, looking at the chat and listing questions. Um, Jeremy, over to you. And of course, if you have questions, please keep uh, asking them on the on the chat. Okay, so we got a lot of questions. Uh, the first one from uh, Matthew is about uh, which crops are we covering, or are we able to on which crop are we able to uh, to provide some traits with UAV? Well, we, we um, I'll have a go at that one. So maybe, it's, maybe you can repeat the question. Yeah, that, so the, just to make sure you held the question. So the, the question was about uh, which crops we we are able to cover using uh, UAV. So we've done a lot of um, work on uh, uh, on cereals. So we, we've done work on wheat, uh, we've done work on maize uh, and, and uh, sugar beet. Potatoes, potatoes um, on vegetables as well. We we work on uh, carrots and um, salads, and uh, so I'm thinking at the same time everything we cover. But um, we've done. Um, but I, I think there are to to answer uh, in a more broader way maybe the question. There are traits for which. Uh, the, uh, the application might work on any crops, uh, more or less, depends on, on the resolution. Of course, you have to adapt the resolution of the images to, uh, to the crops. But for example, traits like um, uh, the green fraction or the color fraction, uh, traits like uh, the, the canopy height, uh, well, it's quite general uh, thing that can be applied to, uh, to most of the crops. Uh, then there are traits that for which you need to adapt the, the modules, the, let's say the, the interpretation methods. Um, generally, these are traits uh, that are derived from machine learning, uh, like deep learning. So everything that is connected to the identification of organs or plants, uh, it's more specific to a, to a given crop. So we have worked uh, on some of the crops, of course, not all. Uh, but it, it's possible to um, develop uh, a, a database, a training database for a new crop, and then apply the same kind of principles to, uh, to identify these plants or organs and, and so on. So that's maybe yeah. some, some yeah, they, like that. A lot of the work we do in with, with the R&D team, um, had IFN, for instance, and, and with, with our CAP uh, partners is to, um, well, one thing we, we always bring forward is the fact that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, as Fred explained, uh, there are different cases, different applications for depending on, on the crop, the traits, and so on. Um, and for instance, one, one thing we've done recently on um, uh, on uh, grapes is to understand what type of sensor do we use, what type of acquisition protocol, and, and so on. So, so we do a lot of work to make sure that we can adapt and you know, adapt the, 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 the equipment and, and the, the, the methods to to the, the application and what we are trying to measure. Um, so, yeah, that's it. 
next question. So the next question uh, I think is more about um, uh, our standard uh, coveting procedure. Uh, because Hassam is asking what is the uh, ground uh, sampling dis distance uh, that we advise to, uh, to, to get our different uh, traits. Resolution. Yeah, resolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, have a go. Where was it? I guess it's back to, to what we just discussed. So the question was about the resolution and the ground sampling distance we need um, for uh, some of the traits we, uh, we listed here. and, and um, Depending on, uh, as uh, Fred mentioned, like anything to, to do with method that use machine learning, deep learning, uh, like we talked about uh, plant counting, for instance. Uh, obviously, the, there is a very specific resolution to, to target when we acquire the data to make sure the, the job can be done. And these are part of the, uh, the acquisition protocol we provide, so the checklist that we provide uh, to the drone operator. Uh, include the precise resolution, uh, the ground sampling distance we uh, we are looking for, and therefore the flight altitude to to uh, input and so on. Uh, so depending on the, the the I'd say a lot of parameters like the size of the field as well, uh, we 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 target a resolution that is that should be very very uh, fine. So uh, for plant counting, um, there there is not a a specific rule, but we, uh, we always suggest to have a sub-centimeter uh, type of resolution. Yeah, see, actually, it's, uh, the resolution depends on the size of the organs. So, let's, uh, rule of thumb is to get a uh, uh, resolution that is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 1 over 10, the typical length of, uh, or dimension of the uh, organs. So, for example, for the um, uh, stem counting where after harvest so the stem is about two milli two millimeter diameter and then we need to get 0.2 millimeter uh, resolution in order to get uh, a good result good result for for identification of the stems and then count them or clarify them for um, the wheat uh, plant uh, counting at emergence it's about the same kind of resolution because it's very uh, small uh, uh, small elements and in addition we need because they are quite vertical uh, it's better to look uh, at them at 45 degrees in order to get a better cross section a larger cross section then plant counting the big plants uh, like uh, maize or sunflower or sugar beet and, and so on resolution is typically uh, 0.5 centimeter uh, that, that we are using uh, with, uh, with success uh, then you can degrade maybe slightly, but not, not too much, otherwise it uh, will get uh, good results. Uh, so it, it depends. And of course, if you uh, compute a vegetation index um, over the whole micro plot, well, you need a resolution of maybe uh, 20 centimeters, so that's enough. <laughs> so you can cover the, the field very, uh, very quickly. It's fine. Next one. Yeah. Um... I think uh, you already answered the next question, but just uh, to, uh, so to repeat the uh, thing. Um, David is asking if we are able to, to, um, to compute um, the vegetation uh, height from uh, RGB only and not, uh, based, uh, on, not only based on the LIDAR uh, data. Yes, yes, of course. Um, with UAV, first, uh, the, the LiDAR that are existing, generally, they, they don't have a very uh, accurate, a very um, fine resolution. Um, so if you are just inter interested in the height uh, on the canopy, uh, probably uh, UAV uh, with a structure flow motion is uh, very well adapted. That would be different if you are interested in the profile of interception uh, within the canopy. But if you are just uh, interested in the canopy height, this is... Uh, this is fine enough. And then what we have seen that in this case, you don't need to get a too, um, a, a too fine resolution. Um, typically, you need a resolution of around uh, the centimeter. Because if you have a too fine, centi uh, too fine resolution, uh, the structure of flow motion uh, techniques will uh, fail to, uh, in many cases, to find a good match between uh, different points and then the tie points and then uh, okay this will result in a, let's say poor uh, 3d uh, cloud uh, point uh, so okay that's, that's 
Okay. So, um, the next question I think is really important. Uh, David and Amelia uh, are asking about uh, the ground trust. Uh, can we trust in, uh, in the iPhone uh, data? And um, David is asking specific specifically how often are we, um, um, uh, how often are your trades algorithm validated with ground trust uh, data? So we make this every year for every client. So what is our uh, validation strategy? Okay. So just to just make sure you have the question, it's uh, as well. Um, asking here about the, the grand truth measurement and how often do we validate um, the, the results with the grand truth data. And uh, typically uh, what we, it, it depends on the application and the, the, the way the, the client uh, teams, I, I'd say, is, is set up. Um, but we have most clients uh, uh, who ask to validate uh, the data with grand truth uh, measurements that they collect from, from the field themselves. So quite often we have uh, uh, data sets to use to compare the results of um, our algorithms. Uh, and the, this is not really true for plant counts uh, and, and other trades. So um, we have clients who collect uh, tons of grand truth measurements and some who uh, collect a very limited amount. Uh, so we have a, a, a bunch of rules uh, to make sure that the validation with grand truth data um, works well. The first is to make sure that the grand truth data is collected on the day we uh, typically do the flight. Um, quite often we have clients who uh, tell us the, um, the correlation is not good enough, but, but that's only because the grand truth data was collected two, two weeks or a month later than the flight. So obviously we are not comparing apple to apple. So we have a, a set of rules uh, uh, such as the, the time of collection and also the, the type of indicators to use when comparing uh, uh, and, and assessing the accuracy of the results. Uh, and um, so, so yeah, we, we do typically that for every, every client we work with, uh, comparing to grand truth data. Um, and um, typically, I, I guess it all depends on thinking about the traits and uh, the level of accuracy. Uh, it really depends on the, on the traits and the, um, um, but the, the, well, we, the, one of the indicators we use is the uh, RMSE to, to set the, uh, and, and describe the accuracy level. And, and uh, we, we, um, we have very good results on plan count, for instance. Um, uh, so that, that is all um, very encouraging as well. Yes. I think the, the, the question is not only uh, the validation, but it's also the calibration because for uh, machine learning uh, techniques, uh, traits derived from machine learning techniques, uh, then we are never sure that uh, the new uh, images that we are entering in the uh, interpretation model uh, will be consistent with uh, what the model has been trained, has been learn learning uh, up to now. So gen generally what we are doing, we are taking a few images from the new data set, then adding that to the uh, uh, to the training the, the, the already existing training da database to get an, an updated uh, database and then apply that to uh, to uh, the whole data set or and including the new data set and of course in this uh, process we will keep few of the images for for validation independent validation yeah, yeah that, that's important because we, we have some clients who do not collect any ground truth data so so we we can provide a set of um, uh, validation uh, data sets like using visual inspection or, um, or a set of flags that we set for every trait we have, a set of automated flags uh, that assess the quality. So, so we have a, we, we, we always validate the, the quality of the, the results, whether we have crunch truth measurements or not. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, so we talked about uh, wheat, uh, corn, and uh, all the crops that we can uh, cover. But we didn't talk about um, uh, trees. And Magali is asking if our, um, um, if our methods can be applied uh, to uh, trees. And, um, and, the, and Magali is asking if, we, if uh, the, the big volume of the trees and the shadow um, 
in the, in the, with the trees can be a problem to, uh, to our methods. Okay, so we we haven't worked too much on trees, but we have worked on uh, vineyards, uh, which are some kind of small trees. <laughs> um, but it depends on the traits, I think. So there are traits that are easily derived on trees or on crops, like uh, uh, canopy height. So in terms of the trees, it will be, uh, let's say, the description of the, the tree crowns, at least the upper um, description of the, the upper the upper crown of description. Um, from that, that's very interesting because it's it's, possi it's a possibility to uh, uh, just to focus on the tree crown um, and then to characterize uh, uh, traits like uh, maybe chlorophyll content. So we haven't worked on that, but it should be possible to, uh, uh, to, to characterize that by the same type of method as we used on, the, on sugar beet, just concentrating on the green leaves. Um, probably uh, it's possible to derive estimates of the greenery index uh, from the volume of the ground and maybe an estimation of um, the, uh, uh, let's say, the, the leaf density that we have. Uh, especially if we have got uh, near infrared images, uh, it should respond to, to, the, uh, uh, to the leaf density. So it's possible to derive that. But again, uh, this needs to be uh, uh, more deeply investigated. Uh, so I think there is no um, difficulties, at least to characterize the top uh, of, a, of a crown. Of course, uh, characterizing uh, the fruits uh, may be difficult because we don't see them. Or characterizing the uh, the sign of the, the crops might be also difficult because it's not so easy to uh, uh, to see the, the sign of the, of the of the trees of the crops. So uh, the next question are more about uh, agronomy. So we are happy to have this kind of, uh, of questions. Um, the first one is uh, from uh, Thea. I think it's from uh, Germany. Uh, which growth stage do you consider best for this is uh, assessment? <laughs> it depends on the crops yeah. and on the diseases. It's difficult to say, I think, in a general way. Okay, maybe you can uh, ask uh, Thea to, uh, to write uh, on the mm. chat uh, okay. disease and, uh, and, uh, and a crop or oh, weeds. So what about <laughs> What is uh, sure is that it's very difficult to get early detection of the diseases. Uh, so it's not a big problem for plant breeding because uh, okay, we, well, the interest of breeder, breeders is to get an estimation of the uh, sensitivity of the, of the genotype to the, to the disease. So you can see that not only on the early stages, but you, then the the disease develops and you can see uh, the difference uh, later where, when it's uh, much easier to, to see them. But that's true that for um, application to uh, decision support uh, making, when early detection of uh, diseases is very important, this, this is a difficulty uh, currently. It's, uh, it's quite difficult to get. So the next question, I think it, uh, it could be a, a whole webinar, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, Merdal is asking which vegetation indices uh, has, uh, or which uh, trait uh, has a higher correlation with for estimating biomass and uh, at the end, the yield. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I can try to answer that. <laughs> um, so what, what you see from UAV is mostly uh, the leaves and uh, the, the canopy structure, like the height and, and those kind of things. So you, you don't see directly the biomass. Uh, so if we take the example of the wheat, for example, uh, at certain stages, there are strong relationship, allometric relationship between, uh, for example, the green area index and the biomass. But these relationship depends uh, from stages to stages and also depends uh, slightly uh, from genotypes uh, on, on the gen genotype. Uh, so um, uh, so it's, it's not so easy. So you can use any uh, vegetation index. 
you will always be stuck by, by this difficulty uh, to get, um, let's say, a robust relationship between uh, structural traits, uh, like uh, different index, uh, height, and, and so on, and the biomass, because uh, the relationship is not, is not uh, straightforward. OK, thanks for the answer. Um, we have another question. Uh, Should we want one more? Yeah, yeah. one more. OK. okay. Um, A good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so it's a more general uh, question about our drone uh, slides. Is, um, uh, from uh, microbots vectorization to uh, uh, traits, um, how is automated? Uh, how our service is uh, fully automated? Do we need the manual work and which uh, at which step? Yeah. So the uh, every, everything after the, the the configuration of the. The, the trial uh, is basically automated. So the, the part that is, um, in a way, time consuming or that requires any kind of manual adjustment is the part at the beginning when we, for instance, play with a shape file or when we uh, uh, try to understand the configuration of the, the field and trial. Um, this is the part uh, that for, for us is, in a way, the most time consuming, uh, often because we receive uh, the, that type of input in different formats. So sometimes we will get a shape file from a client. Um, sometimes we'll get an Excel file that contains different type of information. Um, we all always have back and forth with the client to, to validate um, the information. Um, and th this is the part that is uh, really the, the I'd say the, 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 the most manual uh, in, in, in that sense. Uh, when all of the, that information is set up in the system, um, then we uh, we process uh, all all the, the traits automatically. So the, the the photogrammetry part is is all automated. So we have a pipeline uh, called Phenoscript that basically uh, lines up all of the steps to do with uh, stitting images all the way to microplot extraction and so on. Um, and then the part after that, uh, computing the traits, is also uh, automated. The, on, the only manual checks we would have within that um, part of the job is uh, when we validate. Um, so quite often we extract some uh, results and we ask the team to manually check uh, as well as we have flags automated that tell us if there's something went wrong. Uh, but even without, with or without flags, we, we always do a little bit of uh, manual check along the way. Um, so, but, but these are um, very, very quick. Uh, they, they are not time consuming. Um, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's how, how we uh, that how our, how our pipeline is uh, is uh, developed. Yeah. Um, I think the, it's uh, the end of the question. I just put in the chat uh, a link to uh, all the EMT cards, uh, yep. uh, scientific uh, papers, uh, in a way to explore a bit more deeper what we are doing uh, at Lamia. Yep. Thank you, Jeremy, and th thank you all for the questions. Uh, any questions we haven't answered that uh, are still in the chat will be answered uh, separately, and we'll probably post a, um, uh, an article somewhere on the website uh, that we will uh, share with you all, uh, answering the, the remaining questions. So th thank you uh, for, for the questions. Um, the last part that we wanted to talk about is the this, what we call here the surprise gift. Um, what we uh, are very excited about uh, is to basically announce the, the partnership that we are uh, uh, launching with Planet Labs, which is a, a satellite uh, imagery provider. Uh, so we, we are uh, launching this partnership and uh, we will be very excited to talk about that with you all um, in, in a, an upcoming webinar next month. So, so here we have a lot of uh, exciting uh, uh, news to and, uh, and applications uh, to talk about about how to use uh, planets uh, satellite imagery uh, for precision agriculture so we we hope that you'll share the excitement with us and uh, and that will uh, we will you you will uh, attend the the event so the, the event will take place on the 7th of november 
uh, and we will have uh, two uh, two speakers. One one from uh, uh, Planet, so uh, Rachel Mayer will, will be with us, and Alexis uh, from Hyphen uh, will uh, will present to you the, the the partnerships and the and the, the the objectives here and the applications and so on. So. So please uh, register for, for this one. You'll receive an invite uh, very soon. And um, we hope to see you all uh, back uh, in, in November. So th thank you very much for your participation, uh, for the questions, for listening. And if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to get in touch with us. And um, uh, on that note, thank you uh, very much. And so I'm being LinkedIn, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, one of my duty was to uh, let you know about the LinkedIn page and uh, if, if you need to uh, have any news uh, about Hyphen and, uh, and Cap, then you can follow us on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and, uh, and uh, you, you can get the, the latest news there as well. So th thank you guys. Uh, thanks for your time and, um, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you, Fred. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.